to take this wonderful opportunity to introduce a dear friend of mine, um, this is Annie O, um, the address of the Full Circle Tea House. Um, she's also a uh, former journalist and reporter, brings an incredible skill set that she does, and um, helps to run an amazing production company. And I am really inspired by Annie's devotion to empowering Aesthetically awe inspiring spaces as a way of helping people to have benefits and enhancements and positive experiences and like really wholesome awesome good connection. And I'm constantly blown away by the integrity of her work. And I'm really excited for y'all to be able to talk about the Circle T House and her other projects. Welcome you all. I would like to uh, start by thanking the University of Colorado and the Student Psychedelic Club for inviting me here to come and speak. I think this is a terrific community and I'm very happy to see a university step up and sponsor a symposium like this. I think it's a very good sign that academic and intellectual research communities are really looking at some very interesting questions regarding psychedelics. I'd also like to extend greetings from my psychedelic community. I live in Haight-Ashbury, America's first psychedelic neighborhood in San Francisco. And I come from a beautiful psychedelic community based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And some of my friends are here with me and I'm delighted to be traveling with them here to Colorado to meet with you all. It's been a great honor. I want to talk uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm uh, a journalist, as Jay said. Uh, I'm also an artist. I create what I call collaborative community art. And I'm going to talk today about some of the collaborative community art that me and other members of my community have created. In particular, a piece of art called the Full Circle Tea House that we all just created together at the Burning Man Festival out at the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. We just got back a couple of days ago and um, it was quite an experience, and I have some photographs from that event to show you all today, which I think will be a lot of fun. So as Jay said, um, I'm, I'm interested in community art. About 10 years ago, I started a uh, group called the Women's Visionary Congress. I'm a journalist by training. I'm a science and technology reporter. And I kept noticing, covering psychedelic conferences, that there were very few women presenting at these conferences. And yet I knew a lot of women in the psychedelic community who were researchers or activists or healers or artists. And I really believe that, you know, if you want to change the world, throw a better party. So I started the Women's Visionary Congress about nine years ago. And uh, it's still, as far as we know, the only women's psychedelic nonprofit organization in the US. And Jay Starfox and many other people of all genders have presented there and contributed to that project. And it goes on. If you'd like more information, you can go to visionarycongress.org and learn more about it. I believe that collaborative community art projects are a powerful way to take our psychedelic family values forward into the world. And I want to talk a little bit about really what that looks like from my perspective. Um, Star Fox pointed out that psychedelic, the word psychedelic means mind manifesting, psyche and delic. And I believe that these projects that I've been involved with and our tea house project in particular that I'm going to talk with you today about 
is a way for us to manifest what we have learned in our psychedelic experiences and also acquire some very practical skills that can serve our communities in very positive ways. I put this first slide up here because this is kind of a, a blue sky notion, right? Taking our psychedelic experiences and doing something practical with them. But really, I think psychedelics teach us that we are all connected, all beings are connected. And psychedelics teach us empathy for all beings. It teaches us compassion. It teaches us the beauty of service. It teaches us how to take care of each other, how to make the world a better place. And along the way, I think we've learned some very practical skills. The Haight-Ashbury Psychedelic Community started 50 years ago. We're now in our third generation of psychedelic warriors. I've been a psychedelic person for 35 years, and I've learned a thing or two along the way, going to festivals and gatherings and events. And I took some of those lessons, and together with an amazing group of people, I did some interesting art with those lessons and that knowledge. So I want to start just by pointing out that you can say that prohibition has failed. This is a slide actually from alcohol prohibition. Prohibition has failed, do something about it, right? Be practical. I'm not advising you vote the straight democratic ticket, as the slide says here. You know, you do what you, you want to here. But, but the idea was that, was that when alcohol prohibition failed, women, families, saw it as, a, as an opportunity to counteract what they saw as the evils of prohibition, alcohol prohibition, and to do something positive against that. And, and I really think that we can take what we learn as psychedelic people and, um, and do something about it, really bring our own knowledge to assist our communities. So this is a, an image from the Women's Visionary Congress. That's actually a Cote Lorenz manifold. It's a, it's a mathematical image of chaos theory. It's actually a crocheted image. A woman crocheted it. It's one of our images. This is an image from one of our events done by an artist named Martina Hoffman, who is from Denver, whom I'd like to give a shout out to, an amazing psychedelic visionary woman artist. And this is our group of psychedelic people who are part of our women's psychedelic community. As I say, people of all genders and people of all generations working together to form a really strong psychedelic community. It's a beautiful thing. The woman on the right is Maria Mangini, who is the co-founder of the Women's Visionary Congress and uh, a nurse practitioner and midwife. She now is doing work with dying people interested in working with psychedelics and the dying process. We have artists, lovely people, and Really, what we do is to continue a tradition of using what we know, using art to take care of ourselves. And I don't really like the term harm reduction, per se. I like the term risk reduction and benefit maximization. What can we do as artists and as knowledgeable people to maximize the benefits of these experiences? Well. One of the things that we do in our community is we drink tea. We are tea people. And this is an image of a couple of teapots on a tea table. Our tea community is um, very interested in a certain kind of tea in particular called pu'er, which is an aged Chinese black tea. And we do a modified version of the traditional Chinese gung fu tea ceremony, which involves clay pots and little cups poured into pitchers. And we also really enjoy herbal teas. You'll see that the glass teapot in the background is full of an herbal tea. We call ourselves flavor trippers. 
we really, really like tea. And one of the reasons we like tea so much is because tea is, um, is a, a powerful psychoactive substance. Tea, of course, has caffeine, the world's most widely used psychoactive drug. Who here ingested caffeine today? Right. We're all having a psychoactive experience together. <laughs> Isn't it lovely? <laughs> now, the caffeine in tea is metabolized into uh, theophylline, which relaxes the smooth muscles in the airway and makes breathing easier. It, it stimulates the rate and contractions of your heart. Theobromine, also a heart stimulant, a mild diuretic. It, it improves blood flow and reduces blood pressure. And um, all of these are, are benefits. It also has T, L-theanine, which is found in the, the tea plant, Camellia sinensis, which increases alpha brain waves associated with uh, an alert and relaxed state, which can improve your attention and cognitive function. And it, um, it affects your neurotransmitters um, inside your brain, GABA and dopamine. Tea is a powerful, powerful substance. And we are a plant tribe. There has always been plant people within the psychedelic community. And we are among that part of the psychedelic community who really embraces plants. And we do it through our tea service. This is another shot of how we drink tea. You can see the herbal teas here. We serve a number of herbal teas to people. We drink them ourselves. We have a tea called Nourishment, which has mint and nettles and alfalfa in it, very, very nourishing. A Tulsi rose tea, which has Tulsi basil and rose buds. It's an adaptogen. It helps you adapt to extremes of heat and cold. We have a a tea called Chronic Tonic that was the most popular tea we served at Burning Man this year, which has slippery elm and ashwagandha and shizandra berries and Siberian ginseng and rhodiola root and licorice. It's delicious. It's very good for you. We have a chill-out tea. We have many different kinds of calming teas. The chill-out blend that we put together includes chamomile, peppermint, lemon balm, lemongrass, licorice root, stevia, Damiana, marshmallow root, and it's delicious. So this is a way for us to subtly change our consciousness through the use of plants and really become closer to the plants that make up our teas and really embrace this very, very long tradition of people who are very interested in plants and how they change our consciousness. So you can see that we've done a modified version of this Kung Fu tea ceremony. This is a, a wooden tea tray that we often serve on, little teacups, glassware, earthen pots. This tea gear is easy to come by. It's inexpensive and it's beautiful. This was our tea house at Burning Man this year. It's a beautiful space, absolutely beautiful space. The most beautiful tea house that we have ever built. Thousands of people came to drink tea with us. It was a lovely experience, a really powerful experience, a community experience. You can see we have a, a tea bar in the background and we're also serving on our wooden trays in the foreground. We were tucked away on a little back street. Thousands of people found us. And they found us because we're offering, as a piece of community art, a place for people to come and rest and hydrate and have quiet conversations and integrate their psychedelic experiences, be in community, tell their stories, be together, not be alone. We gave away 500 gallons of water we poured countless, countless cups of tea. It was a really, really successful and beautiful piece of collaborative community art. And I hope that you can all join us 
in the Tea House someday. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit about why we build a tea house and, um, and how we do it. And I'm a practical person. I've learned a lot of practical skills doing this. And, and, and I've had the great fortune to work with some amazing people with this, in this tea house project. A number of folks are here today. Could everyone who worked in the tea house or drank tea with us raise their hand, please? Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, amazing people, yeah. I'm gonna toast you all with my cup of tea, thank you. It's a Samal number 17, one of my favorite pu'ers. You all think you have really great names for cannabis here in Colorado, well, we have some really great names for our, the pu'ers that we serve. We served about 12 different pu'ers and about 15 different kinds of herbal teas. We serve pu'ers called mengsong and samao and pomelo and a bamboo, a tea that was aged in bamboo. Pomelo is a citrus fruit tea that's aged in citrus fruit. Lovely, delicate flavors, beautiful teas. We buy them from a tea dealer north of San Francisco called, named David Lee Hoffman, uh, who is a, a mad genius, we think and uh, has imported all these teas from China over the years. And uh, we're honored to drink his teas. And I suggest you do too. You can buy them online. Tea, as it turns out, is a very comforting ritual. It's hydrating. It's relaxing. You can see in our tea house a lot of people are resting, sleeping, talking with each other, having quiet conversations. The tea table is a communal event. I think the risks that people run when they have psychedelic experiences is the risk of loneliness, the risk of dehydration, the risk of being exhausted, the risk of not having a place where they can come and talk with other people, the risk of not being able to connect, the risk of not having a place where they can integrate their experiences. And you can do all those things in Tea House. And that's why we create it. You can see that this is an image from our Tea House at Burning Man this year. We have a, a tea bar that was carved out of scrap plywood by an artist friend of ours named Koa. It's beautiful. And we make the space beautiful, but it's simple. It's not a complicated thing, as it turns out, to create a tea house. You can build a simple tea bar from plywood. You can gather a bunch of rugs and pillows, all of which are donated. I'll talk a little bit more about the structure that we use, but you can see that it's not, not a complicated thing. I very specifically had this vision of a tea house that was simple and inexpensive to create, easy to put up, that could be replicated by other people. Our teaware is easy to acquire, but beautiful to look at and handle. We use the clay pots, the Yixing pots for the pu'er, and the glass pots for the herbal teas, as I said, and we pour into glass pitchers so that people can admire the color of the tea. It's a visual experience, it's a sensual experience. These are some of the teas that we were serving this year at Burning Man. I like this image because you can see the bamboo tea that's aged inside the bamboo. Those are tea knives we use to pry open the cakes of tea. And we have a whole service area behind the serving area or behind the main part of the tea house where we store the tea, prepare the teapots, serve the tea. And we pour a lot of tea. We serve tea 24-7 for a week at Burning Man, and we always give it away for free. We don't ever charge people for tea. We raise the money ourselves to offer the tea as a gift, and 
we've come to a number of festivals in addition to Burning Man. We go to big festivals like Symbiosis, smaller festivals, private events. We've put teapots in our backpack and served on the street at Occupy demonstrations. This is an image from a private party that we did a few years ago. This is another image from our tea house this year. These are some of our herbs that we have mixed together to create our herbal blends. We buy our herbs from Mountain Rose Herbs. They're organic. We hand blend all of our teas. Anyone could buy them. We're happy to share our recipes. I think that collaborative community art should be like open source software. You shouldn't brand it. You should give it away freely to other people so that they can do interesting things with it. And we uh, would be happy to tell you how we blend our teas. Go ahead and try it. They're delicious. Holding on to our teas. It's beautiful. Our tea blender is here, Felix Thunderstorm. Thank you so much. Woo! <laughs> That's him holding, holding our teas after being blended. And as I said, we're plant people. This is a view out my window in Haight-Ashbury. This is a Mephisticodendron. We enjoy all kinds of plants. This just happens to be a, a very exotic plant collected by Evan Schultes, the famous ethnobotanist from a certain valley in Colombia. We, we honor all plants, and uh, this is a, we don't drink this plant. This is a, a plant that just grows for, the, we admire its beauty. So there are herbs that we blend in our teas and plants that we admire. Beautiful. Gung Fu style tea service. So when we serve tea to people, what we found is that the very act of sitting at a tea table and receiving a cup of tea is very grounding for people having psychedelic experiences. Because the cups are very small, so it's an act of receiving over and over again. The moment your cup is drained, some, your tea server will fill your cup back up. So you can, you can be served, you can be welcomed. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to come in with anybody. You can come in by yourself. Because we don't serve alcohol, our tea house attracts a lot of interesting people. It attracts people from the psychedelic community, of course. Alcohol and psychedelics, as we know, is not a good combination. Alcohol is an inferior drug. It's an inferior social drug. And for a psychedelic community, it's extremely inferior because mixing alcohol and psychedelics is um, not really beneficial. But people miss the bar experience. They miss the experience of going to a bar and being able to sit down and, and be among other people. So we offer that to people without the alcohol. There have been a number of very interesting folks show up at the tea house. People, of course, who are straight edge folks who don't do psychedelics or any other substance, don't do alcohol, or are, are just enjoying themselves without any substances. We make a lot of space for those people, and we welcome them. We've had um, a number of uh, Mormons come to the tea house, of course. Mormons don't do substances. They don't drink caffeine, but they drink um, herbal teas. We've had some lovely Muslim folks come and drink tea with us, Orthodox Jewish folks, other people from different religious traditions who are not attracted to the alcohol culture at many festivals, but love the tea house. The Persians who came in last year from Iran said, yes, we've been building tea houses for 5,000 years. Um, nice effort. <laughs> We're like, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Beautiful tea service. Our friend Ra serving tea, who's here with us today. Yeah. Serving tea. So we started our first tea house in 2011. We've been doing it for five years all over the country. 
There are now five spin-off tea houses that have been created from our tea house. This is a tea house we built at the Symbiosis Festival at Pyramid Lake. There's a lot of love, a lot of hugging that goes on in the tea house. A lot of beautiful people like our friend Fritz on the left-hand side who has inspired us in our tea service. Very beautiful and loving person. But, you know, like any spiritual practice, you've got to chop wood and carry water, right? Then, then you get to the lovely moment. And before we even set off on our tea adventure, what are we doing? Here we are vacuuming rugs in Haight-Ashbury, getting ready to load up for a tea house adventure. It takes a lot of work to keep these rugs clean. We have about 30 donated rugs to adorn our tea house with. This is my truck, the first time we ever tried to load up all of our tea gear and, and uh, create a tea house. Um, all hail the giant pickup truck. You know, you've got to get it there somehow. Practical skills. We've learned over the years how to load trucks more efficiently, how to be good drivers, how to tow trailers and vehicles. Yeah. That's uh, it's a big job. Thank you, um, my pickup truck. Kudos. I have this saying, fewer psychedelic therapists, more truck drivers, please. <laughs> we, need, we need more drivers. Please learn how to drive a big truck and haul a trailer. It's a very useful skill, especially in uh, places like where this truck has gone out in the desert. So. Our first tea house in 2011, we built at the Burning Man Festival, way out in the middle of the Black Rock Desert. And uh, there's nothing out there. I don't know how many of you have been to that festival, but it's just a big, wide open, petrified lake bed. Kind of looks like this. This, uh, this was our uh, campsite uh, this year at Burning Man. We get out there a week early to build our tea house. There's nothing there, a couple of other people, maybe. And uh, we've got a big 200 by 250 foot square of dirt, basically. And we create everything we need to build our tea house. And in the process of doing that, we've learned a lot of very practical skills that I think will carry us through to all sorts of future adventures. There's nothing out there, a lot of road cones. Looks like this. We get out there a week early and start building. There are a lot of other artists out there building at the same time, and we try to open as soon as we can to serve the other artists. So we're out there for a full two weeks. We just got back a few days ago, and uh, it was quite an adventure. We form a, a camp to help support the tea house at places like Burning Man, and we charge each of our campers a camp fee. That's how we finance the project. We don't take any money from the Burning Man organization or any other organization. We raise the money ourselves. I think that collaborative community art should be self-financing, should be sustainable financially, and I think we'll get better and better at that as we do it. But we get to build on a piece of beautiful land. The yurt that you see in the middle was built by our friends this year from MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who a year after we built our tea house without any official association with the Burning Man organization said, hey, you're doing risk reduction, benefit maximization. Let, we, we have those skills too. We, we want to form a zendo. And we're like, great. Let's work together. So we have we've been working together. That yurt was across the street from our camp this year, and the Zendo people do very intense one-on-one -on -one care for people who need extra care during their psychedelic adventures. And other people come to the tea house for a different kind of care. It's a beautiful place. They build beautiful art out there. It's fun to go early and watch them build it. This is from another year. We get to watch them build temples like this. It's pretty amazing. And we have to haul it all out there somewhere. 
uh, all the stuff in the back of my pickup truck has now morphed into an entire budget truck full of tea gear. And thank you, Jay Starfox, for driving our truck this year. And to our friend Paul, who was with her, was with Jay when Jay drove the truck. And um, it was an amazing experience for all of us to convoy out to this place. Um, the barrels that you see in the foreground are gasoline barrels, and we have figured out how to run an entire fuel depot out there on the playa. We have to power up our water boilers to heat tea somehow, and we do it via gasoline generators, so we create a, a, a fuel depot there and the budget truck, which um, is stocked full of stuff that we bring out. There are generators. We chain them together so that they don't walk away. We've all learned how to service generators in the middle of the desert, often in the middle of the night. Very useful skill. There's one of our crew members. After Jay drove the big truck, he basically turned it over to us said, okay, let's, uh, let's unload it now. And uh, this is Cheddar, one of our build crew members with the sledgehammer, very important piece of art in our art project because we have to pound a lot of rebar to keep that structure down. And that's a beautiful thing, a well-packed truck is a thing of beauty. It's an art all by itself, packing a truck that's our water container out there that you see, the P8 water container. And that roll of fencing is part of our evapotron that we've developed to get rid of our gray water out there because we wash all of our tea gear, of course. That's my trailer in the background, served as our uh, kitchen and lounge for the whole build crew. And uh, that's the tea bar in the foreground before it was decorated. It's a camp from past years. Sitting around with friends from camp, figuring out how to create the camp and build the tea house. And then it's just a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work in hot sun, dry conditions, high altitude, setting all of it up. We build using car barns, these metal structured canvas-sided buildings that are inexpensive and strong and easy to acquire. And um, we rebar them and ratchet strap them down. And um, they're simple and cheap and, and uh, easy to build. We've given a lot of thought for how to really create sturdy structures that are as aesthetically appealing or neutral as possible. So we all put it together out there, bit by bit. Everything comes out of those canvas bags. Oh, that's a video, a little bit of video of us putting together one of our car barns from another year. We put the sides on. We sit around and think about it some more. We have all of our gear stacked up, ready to go. It's a big hauling packing operation. And that's what our tea house looked like this year after we set it up. There's our water tank in place. We took two 500 gallon, well, two 250 gallon deliveries of water out there, 500 gallons of water in total. We gave away a lot of water just for people's water bottles. Our build crew, what a beautiful group of people, my goodness. Lovely folks, completely dedicated to this project. Another little bit of video from the playa. More of our build crew from this year. We line the outside of the tea house, the outer edge of the tea house, with foam mats so that people can sleep. A lot of people sleep in the tea house. 
It's a safe place to sleep. A lot of unaccompanied women sleep there because they know it's safe. People will drop folks off who are having some difficult experiences there because they know it's a safe place to do that. Camps have brought people there who they knew needed help. If they need one-on-one -on -one care, the Zendo people are there to help them. If they just need to lie down and rest, they're there to help them. And of course, the rugs need to be vacuumed. Yep. Woo! -hoo. And beaten. And everything needs to be tidied up. That's us putting together the tea house this year. Yeah, our vacuum ninja. Fluffing it. The lanterns are from Egypt. The carpets are from all over the world. That's raw with one of the panels of our tea bar that our friend Koa created. Koa is the son of a pa master Polynesian wood carver, and he's brought his own art to it. The first tea house we created was the Saraswati Tea House in honor of the goddess, patron goddess of art and students. That was our first tea house in 2011. And we built it just in the same way. It looked like that. When we first built the tea house, we lived in it for a couple of days because it was our only shelter sometimes. Those are our tea boilers in the foreground. We use the generators to generate electricity with gasoline, and we use these tea boilers to heat the water to a precise temperature to serve. That was our tea house in 2011. You can see the evolution of the space. I think at that point we were using it for our kitchen, putting it together. And then this is the tea house from this year. You can see how it's evolved. Still very simple. Our teacups, I buy them in Chinatown in San Francisco. They're easy to acquire. We wash them. I'm the daughter of a public health nurse. I believe in washing the teacups. There is our washing station in our utility area. Soap, bleach, and rinse. We wash the glassware. You can see how dusty everything gets. We got a complete whiteout out there at Burning Man this year, a couple of times this year, and the whole tea house got dusted. We had to haul everything out and vacuum it all out and de-dust it. There's our altar. We always set up an altar every year in the tea house for people to contribute to. We've learned some practical engineering skills out there. This is our Evapatron. Remember a few slides back, I pointed to a roll of wire fencing. Putting uh, gray water on the surface of the desert and making evaporation ponds is not only very inefficient, it's not environmentally um, sustainable or desirable because it scars the surface of the playa. So a friend of ours named Wilbur created the Evapatron. This is the Evapatron. It's a, a roll of that fencing wire sitting in a kiddie pool, ratchet strapped to the top of our budget truck, and draped in burlap. There's a, a pump that pumps the water up from the kiddie pool. We actually have to carry our gray water up this ladder, put it in the kiddie pool at the base of this contraption, and then it's pumped up to the top and the wind evaporates it. This is the Evapatron 3.0 that we've developed. It's very efficient. And because you've got to carry the water all the way up to the top of this ladder, no one attempts to use it to evaporate their own gray water. It's very effective in that regard. It's just for gray water for the tea house. It allows us to keep the tea house tidy and wash our teacups and get rid of all that gray water, hundreds of gallons of gray water. The uh, Bureau of Land Management uh, has inspected our Evapatron and thoroughly approves. I think that we've offered something to the uh, Burning Man community there. This is uh, one of our old uh, lists of volunteers. We keep the tea house running 24-7 in six-hour shifts, four six-hour shifts a day. We recruit calm, compassionate people to be our tea servers. And uh, this is kind of what the schedule looks like. We have since gone to whiteboards. <laughs> it's our friend Ken taking a nap in front of our whiteboard. 
please volunteer, sign up for tea service. If you ever see us at an event and you'd like to serve tea, we train people on the fly. We keep it simple so that anyone can serve tea. Not only can anyone build a tea house, anyone can serve tea. So if you show up and you say, I'd like to serve tea, we'll go, terrific. We're ready to train you. Are you ready? Are you ready to serve tea? It's awesome. You can see what our schedule looked like that year. And the tea servers are beautiful people. They're really kind. We really look out for the kindest, calmest, compassionate people. They often work with people who are altered and they provide that calm, kind, grounding energy for people who come to the tea house. You see the people sleeping in the background and they just sit there and wait for you to come in. There's one of our volunteers cradling one of our bags of herbal teas. And then service continues. That tea gets served day and night, six hour shifts for as long as we need to. People sleeping. Hundreds and hundreds of people slept in the tea house this year. It was really full. That was our first tea house. You can see people just sleeping in there. Lots of people sleeping. That's what it looked like from the outside. Ton of folks. Another tea house that we built. Hmm, that's at Pyramid Lake. Beautiful folks hanging out with us in our tea house. Another tea house. This is what it looks like at night. We light it up so that people can find us. That's on the playa at Burning Man. And we light up all of the tea gear at night so that it's beautiful, so that if you come in seeking a beautiful aesthetic experience, we'll offer that too. We want the tea house to be beautiful for everybody. It's a popular date destination, as it turns out. As it turns out, a lot of people don't want to go to a bar and get loaded on their first date. Imagine, imagine that. We light up all the tea gear, we make it pretty. This is uh, our tea house at uh, decompression one year, Burning Man decompression in the middle of San Francisco. We've set up our tea houses all sorts of places. This, this tea house is half on a parking lot, half on a lawn. This tea house is at the Women's Visionary Congress. This beautiful, beautiful altar was built. Lovely, serving tea, serving tea. We also really try to take care of our crew. Part of the lesson that we've learned is not just taking care of other people, it's taking care of ourselves. Self-care is a really important part of service. You really have to look out for your crew, your fellow tea servers, your volunteers, we cut up a lot of watermelon, as it turns out. It's a very tasty snack in the tea house. Work with a lot of folks. This is at Pyramid Lake, our tea house there. A lot of people sleeping, serving tea. This is our, <laughs> this is our uh, one of our build crews from past years, including some of the uh, Zendo people and members of our crew. It's an amazing group of people, really lovely. We had a camp of 140 people this year. People from all over the country came and camped with us and paid dues to help keep our tea house going. It's all self-sustaining. The woman on the right is Lene Ponti, who runs the MAP Zendo project. Shout out to Lene. Amazing project, wonderful people. We work together. The guy in the center is Darwin, who built their Zendo structures this year. Serving tea, this is our build crew from this year. Out on the playa, what a great group of people that was. Oh my goodness. We were together for a week building. We had a great time. We ate some amazing food. We made our own sauerkraut. I think I gained weight. We ate so much food out there this year. We learned how to take care of each other. It's a very important lesson. That was the outside of our tea house. Some people sleep outside the tea house. They don't even go inside the tea house. They're just 
It just crashed out outside. It's cool. As our water tank, we light it up because we like to honor the water. One year, we got a water delivery at Burning Man. And they put chlorine in it. It was undrinkable. It was like pool water. And we, we did what all communities do. We have to solve problems. We have to solve conflicts. We have to solve issues. We sat down and we had a cry. We had an emotional release first, and then we figured out what to do. We're smart people. What do we do next? And this guy from our camp raised his hand, and he said, I own a boat. And if you take me into Reno, into the marine supply store, I will, out of parts, make you a two-stage carbon-activated filter and filter that water. And he did. We filtered 500 gallons of water. This year, we got a Berkey water filter, which is like the Cadillac of water filters, and that was awesome. So we're getting better and better at filtering our water. Water supplies can be iffy. We want to serve the best quality water, of course. We're learning these lessons. Is our tea house this year? A lot of bikes parked out front. You can see um, we get dust storms. We get completely dusted, and we just dust ourselves off. People take their shoes off before they come into the space. It keeps it a little cleaner. You can see the ratchet straps, how well it's ratcheted down. Thank you, build crew. That structure wasn't going anywhere. We had. 50 mile an hour winds out there this year, it didn't budge. We've learned a thing or two about engineering. We always give away water. You can see our water container there. People taking off their shoes, people serving. This is after a dust storm. You can see everything's kind of coated with dust. People just come in. The generators go out, the lights go out. People still just come in, drink tea. We light everything up. This is our sleeping porch. A lot of people sleep there. That's our friend Paul, who was heroically serving tea at the very last shift this year. Thank you, Paul. We did a couple different things in camp this year. We built an art car, the Fata Morgana. Lovely. Our camp does other projects aside from just serving tea. We had a really good time building the art car. This is before we left for Burning Man. We got some new canisters for our tea this year to keep all the dust out. One of our volunteers, Stacy, getting some of the canisters. That is uh, the keyboard that we had. While everyone's doing uh, electronic dance music and dubstep, Felix Thunderstorm is playing classical piano music in our tea house. It was beautiful, beautiful. Played a lot of Bach, a little bit of Chopin. Um, people really enjoy listening to quiet music. We don't play any pre-recorded music in the tea house, just acoustic music or just silence. A lot of people are sleeping. We try to keep it quiet or we play classical, which is lovely. And we have lots of cool things that we put inside to make it beautiful, like this piece from India that hangs on an elephant's uh, carrier the things that elephants wear, more the mahootsits. We had a burn barrel this year where people got cold. They could warm up a little bit. It's our camp kitchen. We build our own camp kitchen to support our camp of 140 people who are supporting us. A lot of the Zendo volunteers camped with us this year. And we make beautiful food out there in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful food. Keep people going. That's our freezer, huge, big improvement this year. We, we made a lot of our food in advance and froze it, so we didn't have to cook so much and we're really tired. That's our friend Brad, brought the freezer, had its own generator. Inside of my trailer, our camp kitchen, our friends Lindsay and Alex, who are tea servers, part of our build crew. People eating, hanging out, taking care of each other. Oops. More of our build crew, beautiful people. Serving tea 24-7, no matter what. Dust storms, no dust storms. A lot of people leaving a lot of stuff in the tea house. We have to, we've got to clear out all the stuff that people leave us. They leave us books, they leave us food, they leave their phones, they leave their shoes behind. We have a big lost and found operation. This is what it looks like during a busy afternoon. Serving tea. People ride up on their bicycles. A lot of bikes parked outside. 
serving tea inside, sleeping, evaporating all of our water. And then finally, it's time to pack it all up at the end of it. After 24-7 service for an entire week, we have to gather up the energy to pack it all up, and that's part of the experience too. Piling it all up, putting it back in the truck, making sure that everybody gets home safely. We're tired. A lot of people just show up and help us out. A lot of stuff, more stuff. That's our friend Atulia looking at all the stuff. We're climbing the ladder, evaporating the last of our gray water. That's Jay and Felix during our strike. You can see we're pretty dusted at that point. But those guys are tired. We're all tired, but we made it up safely. Off the playa. And that's the last slide I'll leave you with, and I'll take some questions about this project. You, sir, over there. It's called the Full Circle Tea House now. We changed the name after the second year because it just felt like a full circle. We had gone out there, we had come back, we had completed that circle, we renamed the tea house. It's the artist's prerogative to rename and, and recast their art. And um, we've been out at Burning Man for the last five years. It was my 19th consecutive year out there this year. I uh, imagine we'll be out there next year as well. If you're out there, please come visit us. Next question. Yes, sir. Can you tell, uh, talk a little more about the relationship between the Full Circle Tea House and Brenda and how that was formed in that area? That's a great question. There, it's a really complementary relationship that we've created together. We're all friends. We all know each other. We all train together as uh, psychedelic support people. The Zendo crew does uh, great training at Burning Man and at other events that members of our uh, tea service and volunteer crew attend. Um, they also come in and drink a lot of tea with us when they are off their shifts. If we have somebody come in and it's clear that they need one-on-one -on -one care that the Zendo provides, um, we, this year, could walk them over across the street to the Zendo and make sure they got that care. After people have received care in the Zendo, they can come over to the tea house, ground, hydrate, rest, integrate their experience, have quiet conversations with people. The tea house opens several days before the Zendo does because we have a, a larger build crew. And um, so the Zendo staff does some work inside the tea house with people because it's a quiet space. The Zendo gathers a little information from people uh, when they come in to that space. The tea house, the full circle tea house gathers Some in medical assistance, and it's important to know perhaps what that person's taken to help the medical people provide care. We don't ask a whole lot of questions. We just serve tea, and we make that space available to people. And I think there's a space and place to do that, that should be available at festivals and gatherings. So I think both the Zendo model and the Tea House model work together well. Does that answer your question? More questions? Does anybody here want to build a Tea House? Awesome. Thank you. Talk to us later. Do you have any questions about building a Tea House? You know, it's been very empowering as a woman to learn how to do all of this, all this building, all this construction. You, sir, back there. Um, what is gray water and why do you think that river? Mm, what a great question. Gray water is our wash water, right? When you wash your teacups, you end up with wash water, gray water. We wash our glass pots when we wipe down the surface of of the tea table or the, the tea bar, and all that 
wash water has to go somewhere. We can't just dump it out. That's not environmentally sound in a place like the Black Rock Desert and many other places. So we've learned to evaporate that water in a way that's environmentally friendly. And that's a, a gift that we've given to other people who are also doing washing up of whatever sort at festivals or events. The Evacatron is easy to design and build and create by yourself. The plans for it are online. We can help you build one. I think in parts it costs maybe a hundred bucks to build. You do need a, a tall structure to catch the wind. And uh, we just use our panel truck. And uh, that was uh, an easy solution for us. You might uh, find another way to do it, build a tower or something. I think um, we're going to try to build a more permanent structure for this tea house, for the full circle tea house in the next year or so, and, and also design smaller tea houses that people can build on their own in a kind of modular fashion. My vision for the tea house is a tea house for every bar at the next Ooh. festival. Yeah. I think it's doable, I really do. You know, there's so many bars out there. At a place like Burning Man where it's a gift economy, I think people just confuse the gift economy with free alcohol. Free alcohol, as it turns out, is not really great for communities. Especially psychedelic communities. More tea, less alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. We can do it. No, we can. More questions? Thoughts? Thank you. I think we're out of time. I'll take one more question. Sir. Uh, well, I think the model is to keep it simple, to keep it inexpensive, to ask your community to donate money, to have benefit events like a tea house, um, to ask people to donate rugs and pillows and other equipment, to build your own camp and have people contribute camp dues. All possible. The essence is simplicity. There's great beauty and elegance in simplicity. And there's also great economy in simplicity. Things don't have to be complicated to work well. And things don't have to be complicated to be fun. So I hope that message can carry through with this project. Thank you. Thank you.